Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for braving our lovely New England uh, afternoon to come to uh, tonight's program on the Electoral College and the Future of American Democracy. Tonight's event is being hosted by the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation and the Institute for Politics. My name is Arkan Fung, and I'm the faculty director of the Ash Center. On behalf of all of us at the Ash Center, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which Harvard sits is the tra traditional territory of the Massachusetts people. And we also recognize the continuing presence of the neighboring Wampanoag and Nipmuc nations. Every year, the Ash Center hosts a major symposium on one idea that can make American democracy more robust, participatory, and well, democratic. In this tense election year, we could think of no better topic than the Electoral College. Over the next few days, over the next two days, scholars and practitioners from around the country will explore whether it would be desirable to alter the Electoral College, and if so, what range of alternatives to it are desirable and what the plausible pathways to get from here to there might be. This public event, a conversation between Professor Alex Kazar and Congressman Jamie Raskin, will be recorded. <laughs> and that re recording will be available on the Ash Center's YouTube page. You should also know that there is a photographer here. And so, as I tell my kids, don't do anything that you wouldn't um, do be happy to have posted on social media visibly. Following this conversation, we're hosting a panel from 545 to 645 titled, The Time Once Again for a Serious Conversation about Changing the Way We Elect Presidents with Professors George Edwards, Daniel Allen, and Alex Kazar. People here from the Harvard community who aren't registered to be in tomorrow's symposium are very welcome to attend, but if you leave, no one's feelings will be hurt either. Um, now it is my uh, great pleasure to introduce my good friend, Alex Kazar, who will then introduce Congressman Raskin. Alex is the Matthew W. Sterling Jr. Professor of History and Social Policy. He is a leading historian of democracy in the United States, who has also written on the history of labor and technology. His book, The Right to Vote, The Contested History of Democracy in the United States, uh, was named the best book in U.S. history by both the American Historical Association and the Historical Society. It was also a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and the LA Times Book Award. His magisterial 2020 book, Why Do We Still Have the Electoral College, is the definitive history of this distinctive American institution. So there's no better way to begin, no better person to begin tonight's conversation than Alex. Alex, I'll hand it over to you. <laughs> I'm already being razzed by the congressman. Uh, um, I'm going to stand over. Jamie and I, uh, Congressman Raskin and I, are going to go back and forth a little bit, but mostly we'll be there. But uh, for this formal introduction, I thought I would stand over here uh, behind this equipment. Um, uh, the, my, my first order of business this. Thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> uh, um, so my, my, my first task uh, for the next few minutes is to introduce um, a man who in, in this, in general, and certainly I think in this group really needs no introduction, but in keeping with accepted rituals, um, I, I, will, I will briefly uh, int introduce Jamie and, and truth in advertising. We have been friends for about 25 years. Uh, so, so you can accuse me of bias in this introduction. Um, professor Raskin, as I first knew him, was a professor of constitutional law at American University for 25 years, writing compelling work about voting rights and the law of democracy. In fact, I think I first encountered him in print with an article um, about uh, immigrant voting rights and alien voting rights, which he did in his youth. He then served, and actually simultaneously, three terms as a state senator in Maryland, where he played very, very important roles in passing numerous important pieces of legislation, including for marriage equality, for the abolition of the death penalty, um, and for Maryland joining the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. What? Starting it. Yeah, yeah, that was the first. Yeah, was the, uh, 
<laughs> we'll get to that later. Uh, <laughs> um, thereafter, he graduated from, uh, to the U.S. House of Representatives, <clears throat> where he represents Maryland's 8th District. He was first elected in 2016. And actually, I remember not long after you were elected, talking with you on the phone about you were sort of agonizing about whether or not to attend Trump's inauguration uh, in uh, January of 2017. But we, he was first elected in 2016 and is now- I, I didn't agonize that long. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> you can see how formal this exchange is going to be. Um, uh, and he's now in his fourth term, heading to an almost certain fifth term after the next elections. In his time in the House, he's become a very, very important and prominent leader, serving as the ranking member of the House Committee on Oversight and Accountability, as, and as just about everybody knows, as lead manager of the second impeachment of Donald Trump, and as a member of the very important Select Committee to investigate uh, the January 6th attack. And most importantly, of course, it has to be noted here, he is a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School. Uh, before we launch into the substantive discussion, I'd just like to ask you to join me in a round of thanks to, to Congressman Raskin for taking the time to join us. And for... Thank you. And for everything that he does and continues to do to protect our democracy. Your turn. All right. And, but then I can go to the que substantive questions. You want to go straight to that? Or no, you... no, that's cool. That's cool. I'll, I'll say a few things. Um, so uh, thank you all for being here, Alex. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. I tried to replace the extended introduction with all of the Harvard mentions, which I usually try to censor when I'm speaking in other places, but I guess it's all right here. But uh, but with uh, but I've got a really good synthesized um, um, introduction now, which just says uh, one of Jamie's books, We the Students, was uh, banned last December in uh, Texas. And then uh, the next day, Vladimir Putin banned me for life from ever going to Russia for my <laughs> pro-Ukrainian activities. So and that those are my two proudest accomplishments, I think. Uh, but um, I, I'm delighted to be here for this very important conversation. I was um, uh, giving Alex a hard time because I think in uh, Archon's introduction of him, I heard that somebody gave uh, his truly fantastic book, uh, Why Do We Still Have Electoral College, an award for being the best book in history. And I, and I thought that it was really the best book on history, uh, not in history, but uh, it, it's a certainly a nominee, uh, you know. Um, but anyway, um, I, uh, I have come uh, not um, as a scholar, which means I haven't written anything. I do not have a paper to contribute. That's the great thing about going someplace as a politician. You don't have to write anything. Um, you can just speak. Um, but I am here as a, a true blue uh, Democrat, um, but I also uh, hope to be speaking as a citizen uh, more generally. And so that's why I, uh, I always like to invoke um, uh, the, our last great Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, who uh, spoke of uh, the government of the people, by the people, and for the people, which of course is the, uh, the beautiful tantalizing ideal of American history. Uh, we didn't begin that way. We began as a slave republic of white male property owners over the age of 21, but it's been through successive waves of social and political struggle that we've moved closer, uh, ever closer to a more perfect union, uh, which is, you know, by definition, an always uh, moving target. Um, but if you read the Constitution the way that I do, the vast majority of the rights that are contained um, in the Constitution since the Bill of Rights, since the original 10, are democratizing amendments. They are pro-democracy, equality expanding and deepening amendments, right? So the 13th Amendment abolishes slavery and the 14th Amendment gives us equal protection and due process and the 15th Amendment 
prohibits race discrimination in voting, and the 17th Amendment shifts the mode of election of the U.S. senators from the legislatures to the people. The 19th Amendment doubles the franchise in America by giving us women's suffrage. The 23rd Amendment gave people in Washington, D.C. at least the right to vote for president. The 24th Amendment banned poll taxes uh, in federal elections, and the 26th Amendment lowered the voting age to 18. And there are others that I think you could assimilate also to this trajectory, including the 22nd Amendment and the 25th Amendment. But even without going to those, you see that the whole trajectory of our constitutional and historical development has been towards greater democracy, greater inclusion, greater participation and reflection of the people who are actually in the country. So what we're here to talk about today is very much in the mainstream of American political constitutional uh, development. Um, which is uh, the abolition of another filtering device like the state legislature's selection of senators, uh, the Electoral College. And um, really, everybody's got to read um, Alex's book about uh, how the Electoral College was such uh, a reflection, uh, such a microcosm institutionally of what politics was like at the beginning. Um, of the Republic. I mean, there was no such thing as a constitutional right to vote. I mean, we still don't have an explicit constitutional right to vote, but uh, there's no way that a popular right to vote made any sense in that context where, you know, um, there were different disenfranchisement techniques being used by different of the state legislatures. So um, if we um, look at the demands of democracy today, um, you know, to me, it seems perfectly obvious. It's 2024. How about we start electing the president of the United States the way we elect governors and senators and representatives and mayors and everybody else? Whoever gets the most votes wins. It's not that complicated idea. Uh, and um, so I, I want to mention four different arguments, which are kind of interlocking interlocking arguments that I make when I'm out on the road about this. And then I talk to my colleagues about all the time. And the first is just that the electoral college today, as it's practiced, is as it ever was, strictly speaking, anti-democratic, anti-majoritarian. Uh, it's given us five popular vote losers in our history twice in this century in 2000 and 2016. Uh, we spent hundreds of millions of dollars every year exporting American democracy and electoral institutions to countries all over the world that are writing their constitutions. And the one thing they never come back to us with is, you know that electoral college thing you guys have? Uh, we think we'll adopt that in our country, uh, you know? Um, so so it just, it, it's incoherent. It doesn't make any sense. The second thing that, uh, that I wanna say about it is that in practice, it marginalizes the vast majority of Americans including if this is a Massachusetts audience, primarily everybody in this room, the, the vast majority of Americans live in safe blue states or safe red states. And it's not a question of big or small. If you look at our four largest states, three of them, maybe four of them are all safe states, right? So New York and California are safe blue states. Uh, Texas and Florida, uh, alas, uh, are safe red states, uh, from my perspective. Um, and uh, so you say, oh, right, the Electoral College helps the small states. Not at all. If you look at the dozen smallest states, 11 out of 12 are safe red states or blue states. So you've got like North Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, um, uh, as red states, blue states, uh, Rhode Island, District of Columbia, um, Vermont, right? You could be small, you could big, be big as it make any difference. The only states that get attention under our system are swing states. And there are, um, I don't know if the official tally has been done by the national popular vote, interstate compact people, but um, there's certainly no more than 10 of them. And it's probably more like eight of them and everybody knows what they are. And so, uh, and within the narrow uh, category of swing states, the ones that matter are the big ones. Um, so Pennsylvania is a big swing state, so it's going to matter. Arizona matters. Um, Michigan uh, matters. Now, is, it, is that because they are 
demographically microcosms of the country? Is it because they're more accessible? No, no, they're swing states because of the purely arbitrary and adventitious factor that they have relatively equal numbers of Democrats and Republicans. That's it. So just a purely luck of the draw, right? Uh, the only small state that's also a swing state happens to be New Hampshire, which used to be the also the, the bell of the ball when it comes to the primary system, but I'm not quite sure where that stands now. But anyway, so, um, okay, so most people don't are not active participants and you can see in terms of turnout, the turnout level is eight to 10 points higher in presidential elections in the swing states. That's where the offices are, the campaign headquarters are, that's where the TV ads are, that's where the volunteers go. In Maryland, the safe blue state, we're told just send everybody to Pennsylvania right? That doesn't do wonders for organizing in our state uh, that we're constantly exporting volunteers money and so on to a, to a nearby swing state. Um, okay. The third point that I always make about it is that uh, the electoral college system, because of this bizarre arbitrary it works, um, it incentivizes strategic mischief and corruption. And we saw that very clearly in 2000. Uh, in Florida, um, you know, and some of it is legal corruption. I mean, if you disenfranchise hundreds of thousands of former prisoners in Florida, um, as they do, despite the fact that the vast majority of states have re-enfranchised prisoners once they get out of uh, prison and have done good time and paid their debt to society. But uh, Florida says, no, we're going to disenfranchise. So there were nearly a million people disenfranchised in Florida in an election that was settled by 535 votes, um, you know, a handful of votes. And then, and that's on the legal side. And then on the illegal side, the, you know, two years before uh, that election, there was a, a massive purge done of people uh, who were on the rolls. And that kind of uh, purging process uh, has continued and the voter suppression tactics are replete throughout the country. If you can take, if you can win, Florida by one vote in the popular vote and you get all their electoral college votes, you can take the whole election that way. And that was an election that Gore beat Bush by, by more than a half a million votes. And of course, um, in 2016, Hillary uh, in the popular election beat Trump by um, in more than two and a half million votes, I think 2.7 or 2.8 million votes. So um, the, there are those perverse strategic incentives, those moral hazards that are built into it. And then finally, and this is the point that might hit the closest to home for me now, the electoral college, this convoluted, antiquated, obsolete architecture with multiple rounds that exist of meeting in the legislatures and January 6th and all of the judicial challenges and so on, it, it, uh, is dangerous. I mean, to get you killed, as we saw on January 6th. I mean, remember that election was over. We knew exactly who had won the election and who had won the electors. And us meeting um, under the 12th Amendment in joint session on January 6th at 1 p.m. Um, is supposed to be a ceremonial thing. And yet it was transformed into yet one more stage uh, in a process where uh, a strategic bad faith actor can decide to throw the whole thing into chaos. And uh, there are lots of concerns already brewing about what's gonna happen on January 6th, um, 2025. Uh, the alternative to that is simply having an election and then <laughs> using the administration of the election to determine who won the election. So um, those are the basic points that I would make, uh, you know, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention the national popular vote because um, Maryland was the first state to adopt an interstate compact. And um, what, uh, you know, what has drawn me so powerfully to this idea is that when you look at the history of constitutional changes in the country, generally it is a buildup in the states of a lot of grassroots energy and then mechanisms that the states use to try to work around an undemocratic uh, institutional feature of the original arrangements. So if you look at like women's suffrage, um, there were dozens of states that gave women the right to vote 
by state legislative action or state constitutional action before the 19th Amendment was adopted. That was the big buildup. Or the 17th Amendment, before the legislatures, uh, or before the 17th Amendment shifted election of the U.S. senators from the legislatures to the people, lots of legislatures, can't remember, but it was near a majority of the legislatures were saying, we will we pass a law or we put something in our constitution to say we will be bound by a popular vote for the U.S. Senate. So we will allow the voters to decide and then we will be bound by that. And the national popular vote bears that same family resemblance because it says we're going to get the states together to form an agreement and we will use our plenary power over the Electoral College to say we'll cast our Electoral College votes for the winner of the national vote at the point at which it will be operative in every case when we have at least 270 Electoral College votes in the coalition. And I think Maine just a um, couple of days ago uh, just voted uh, in both houses to join the, the interstate compact uh, coalition. Uh, Massachusetts is part of it. New York's part of it. California's part of it. Maryland's part of it. Unfortunately, it's become uh, a bit of a partisan thing. It didn't start out that way. And I know there's still lots of Republicans for it. But um, the ex-president Trump, who used to regularly denounce the Electoral College and described it as the, making us the laughingstock of the world, um, because he said it, that it doesn't line up the electors and the popular vote has now, uh, in the wake of the 2016 election, found some previously undetected virtues in the system. Uh, and now he likes the way that uh, it's done. And so it has become uh, a partisan split, unfortunately, although, you know, I, I don't think that I don't think it should. And I know one of the things people are talking about here is, um, you know, the progress of the national popular vote campaign, which has really been pretty remarkable, uh, given that we've been stymied in the past, but versus the possibility of uh, other, uh, you know, other kinds of uh, options that are being put on the table. So I'm I look forward to participating and thank you for having me very much, Alex. I appreciate it. So, mm. I'm regrouping because your comments, which you refused to vet with me beforehand, completely screwed up the sequence of questions. Oh, geez, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I will, I, I will, I will regroup. Um, I guess I first I first want to say something of a more introductory sort about what we're doing in this conference and why why we the conference in which uh, this session is the lead off, um, and I mean because it's clear when, from what Jamie said and what pe you know people in this room knew before that before they arrived is that the electoral college uh, is, is is a hazardous institution and an undemocratic institution. Some of the some of the problems with the electoral college have been visible for a very long time, and have been uh, uh, and, and have been the object of protest for a very long time. Others, um, which and you alluded to them quite accurately, can, have come into more dramatic view in recent years, such as the possibility of a quote wrong winner election, which we've seen now twice, and the difficult the the problems with the apparatus, with the clunkiness of. The electoral college but so you know the problems are recognized but another impetus for us having this gathering and trying to spur these conversations is to to try to respond to what i think has been something of a prolonged public pessimism and a kind of pessimism leading to passivity about the possibilities of electoral college reform um, i think that that is present uh, there was, I, I forget actually who it was, there was one congressman, a member of the Senate, who uh, um, who in the 1960s made the comment that, uh, you know, there were three things that you could, you could always look forward to, death, taxes, and reform of the Electoral College. Um, but there was a, a sense, I think, that, that's been abroad for a number of years about that there's nothing to be done, uh, or maybe let the compact people, if they're dealing with it over there. And that's why in this audience here, we've invited a lot of people who, are, who have been very engaged in democratic reform, but not necessarily around electoral college reform, and to try to engage in conversations with them. Um, 
So that's a part of the setting. Um, and then, and I have a series of questions that I'm going to return to the compact uh, a bit later. But let me start with with a with a, a more precise or, or more narrow question, because um, you talked uh, very eloquently um, about the apparatus of, of the electoral college, as you know, with all these different dates and all these different rules, and as opposed to like having an election. Um, I do have to say that my, my, my real claim to fame as a scholar is that I once uh, was quoted in the New York Times, you know, the quotation of the day. Um, I, I, was once I once was given that quotation of the day, and it was because I said something in some public arena, um, like, we should, you know, we should, we should have a presidential election like we elect members as uh, presidents of the student council. You vote, and the person who wins the most votes wins. You know, very, very simple, and that, and that made me famous for fifteen minutes. Um, <laughs> in in any case, going back to the apparatus, um, Congress did pass the Electoral Count Reform Act, which was to deal with some of the clunkiness of the apparatus. And this moving towards specific questions here, um, implicit in what you said, I conclude that you don't think that that was sufficient to deal with the problems of the apparatus. And I'd like to hear your comments about that. Right. Um, do, do I need to go back there? Or you don't have to. No, we can both stay. I'm, I'm not going back there anymore. Right. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, well, I, I should say that, you know, that we had a big debate about the Electoral College on the January 6th Select Committee. Um, and people sometimes think because we were so bipartisan that there was no debate. Like, you know, if you have a bipartisan group, there's not conflicts of views or opinions. And of course, that's ridiculous. And so we had some, you know, really long drawn out debates. And of course, I was on the side saying that um, January 6th should be, um, among other things, the end of the electoral college system. Um, but, uh, well, my friend Liz Cheney is representing Wyoming uh, at the time and uh, has completely swallowed hook, line and sinker the myth that the Electoral College helps the small states. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the Wyoming, of course, is total flyover country. Nobody pays attention uh, to Wyoming in the election. I suppose they get some minuscule percentage lift out of the, you know, two bonus center, senator electors. But um, <clears throat> I think the whole country, you know, would benefit from us having an election where everybody votes, every vote counts equally, and every vote is counted, right? And then you would have people campaigning all over the country, and it would make sense rather than just consigning large parts of the country to safe blue or safe red territory. But anyway, you know, the alternative to that was those who were saying, no, let's just reform the Electoral Count Act. And so I, I didn't oppose those reforms. One of them was to state the obvious, which was that the vice president does not have the authority to step out of his or her role um, in a ministerial administrative capacity just to be presiding over the joint session. Um, and the, no, the vice president does not have the power to appoint the president at the moment when the joint session is meeting. Um, and the other was, the other major change, if I'm remembering properly, was we increased the number of members of the House and Senate that you needed to sign to object, to register an objection. And, and that was, you know, my big role on January 6th was I was leading our answer to the objections coming in to Georgia and Arizona and Michigan and Pennsylvania. Um, and um, at that point, it only took one member of the House and one member of the Senate. Um, and uh, so, you know, and we thought maybe there wouldn't be a member of the Senate, but Senator Cruz decided to object, and all of them decided to get in and start objecting. So um, I, I suppose it's a, you know, it's a, a modest, improved safeguard. But the reality is that even if those rules had been in place in 2020, they would have had the numbers to register the same objections. And so nothing in the, these tiny reforms to the Electoral Count Act remotely address any of the problems in the electoral college that people are here to talk about. Uh, let me let me ask you another uh, small, you know, kind of narrow question, but uh, I don't think it's too narrow, which is that one of the one of the features of the presidential election system, which we don't often talk about, 
is what's called the contingent election system, right? It's what happens if nobody wins a majority of the electoral votes. Um, and in, most of you, I'm sure, know this, but m for those who haven't had your recent refresher in the Electoral College, um, what happens in that case is that the, um, the election reverts to the House of Representatives, where every state delegation gets one vote, right? So no matter the size of the state, it's basically uh, you get what you get one vote. Now we haven't been too concerned most of the time um, about the contingent election process since it hasn't happened since 1824. Although in in 1992, when it looked like it might, um, there was a great deal of support for changing it. Mitch McConnell came out, ardent Democratic reformer, um, <laughs> came out uh, in favor of getting rid of the. Uh, or changing the contingent system. That was partly because Democrats controlled the majority of the House delegations uh, in 1992. Uh, but I guess a question, again, it's fairly narrow, but it's not unimportant. Would there be much support among your colleagues in the House uh, for changing the contingent system um, to say at least make it that every member of the House gets one vote? Mm -hmm. So, but of course, you need to amend the Constitution to do that. That's so, the, at that yeah. point, you may as well just uh, adopt an election. Well, you know, well right? I, I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, but, you, but, you're arguing with the converted. Yeah, right. you, but you but nonetheless, let, let me address your point because 2020 was a year in which we there was intense focus within Congress on um, the so called contingent election under the 12th Amendment. In fact, that I believe was the whole design of. Um, the coup, you know, I mean, the way I see it uh, is there were three rings of activity on January 6th. There was a mass mob riot uh, of people that uh, Trump uh, convoked to just come to Washington. And some came determined to commit violence. Others were just coming to support the election and uh, save democracy as they saw it. There was a middle ring of the, what I call the insurrection, which was the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and the Ku Klux Klan and the Rod of Iron and these religious cults and the people who came in together with the determined idea of attacking the police, invading the Capitol and overthrowing the election. And then there was the inner core of the coup, which had been, of course, going on for weeks. And that was, you know, originally targeted at the state legislatures, then at the state election officials like uh, Raffensperger in Georgia. Trump said, you know, just find me 11,780 votes. That's all I want. You know, and I, my first reaction to that was, I'm a politician. That's all I want, 11,780 votes. <laughs> Give me 11,700. Um, but, you know, the, the, and, then, and then at the Department of Justice, a mini coup. But all of it was leading up to January 6th. Let's get the vice president to step outside of his constitutional role. And within that, we still don't know definitively either what they most wanted him to do or what he might have been willing to do or somebody else might have been willing to do because there were people that they were lining up to take Pence's place. Um, either if he just said, I'm out, I don't want to be part of this, or if he were literally forced out of the building and left. And of course, that was another drama that took place on January 6th where there was an effort by the Secret Service to get him to go in the car. And he said, and I think the six most chilling words of the entire episode, I'm not getting in that car. Um, and he said, I'm not leaving until we count the electoral college votes. But in any event, there was a bifurcated sense. Some people thought that they were telling Pence or whoever his successor might be as the moderator of the proceedings just to declare that Trump was the winner, uh, that was, which was not my view. I think what they were doing was they were trying to say, nullify the votes or return the votes, which of course is neither a constitutional nor a statutory mechanism, but just return the votes to Michigan, to Pennsylvania, to Arizona, to Georgia, and then there will be a failure of a majority in the Electoral College. And then under the, under the 12th Amendment, immediately, the word immediately appears, immediately the House must... Um, move to a contingent election where we're not voting one member, one vote, the way we usually vote, we're voting one state, one vote. Now, why did they do that? Well, they knew, of course, the GOP controlled 27 state delegations. We had 22 delegations. Pennsylvania was split down the middle nine to nine, so its votes would have immediately just evaporated. So it was 27 to 22. 
I think they would have lost the outlarge representative from Wyoming, uh, Liz Cheney, who would have been able to control her delegation's vote. But even with that, it would have been 26 to 23 or 26, 22 to maybe one vote for Dick Cheney or something. I don't know where that would have gone. Uh, but um, in any event, they, they thought that they were going to win that way. And I think that's what they did want to do. Um, so would there be the political uh, center of gravity to say, well, let's get rid of that provision? I don't think so, because um, anybody who would oppose uh, abolishing the Electoral College and moving to a popular vote for political reasons would also um, oppose getting rid of the contingent election. Why? Because, um, because of the way that our system works and it's getting, you know, the redder states are getting redder and the bluer states are getting blue, especially in the wake of the Dobbs decision where a lot of liberals are getting the hell out of states where people can't get an abortion or IVF for whatever it might be. So we're getting greater polarization there. Um, and what that means is that that 27 to 22 split, call it, is likely to remain. You know, and this just coincidentally happens to be the same problem with those who say, well, let's just all do what Maine and Nebraska do, just appoint two electors for the statewide winner and one per congressional district. That just says we should have the presidential results follow the gerrymandering patterns around the country. And if you can gerrymander yourself into a majority in the House, then you should be able to gerrymander yourself into a presidential victory, too. In fact, in many places, in, I mean, this, having district elections was seen as really as the most central reform for the first half of the 19th century. And then people started focusing on gerrymandering and began to say that they uh, district allocation of, of electors. Um, now, 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 let's go back to some things that you said uh, earlier. Um, I mean, you were one of the earliest supporters of the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, and you know, and and you played, I'd say, more than a key role. You played this decisive role um, in get in in getting its adoption uh, by the Maryland legislature. And a truth in advertising. At the time, I was also a supporter of the compact. Um, and I've had second, third, and fourth thoughts uh, since then. And, uh, you know, I'd say I'm, I'm at best a skeptic and really not so much of, a, uh, of, of, an, of an advocate, largely because, and I can discuss this with anyone who wants to talk about it, because I think it's inherently unstable, because I don't think, I, don't, I think it can, it can it, even if it passed all the constitutional hurdles, um, if a state or two decided to leave it, um, afterwards, it would no longer be in force. Um, and so I'm, I'm deeply concerned about that. But ba back in the day when you and I were allies on that subject, but we're still, <laughs> we're still, we're still, uh, we're still, we're still, we're still allies on this broad theme. We did talk a lot about uh, the compact being a very ingenious way to mobilize political support for a long term campaign. Uh, to do, get rid of the Electoral College with the idea that it could then be transformed into or segue into a movement uh, for a constitutional amendment, which would not have the same problems uh, of instability. And you, you, you alluded to this in your opening remarks. And I guess, um, you know, and part of what I've been concerned about a little bit is that at least some people um, who work hard for the compact have been opposed to the idea of, of switching to an amendment. I just, I just like to know your thoughts. None of us has an answer to this about, about the kind of scenarios or methods that could be used to build on the work of the compact to then end with a more stable arrangement like an amendment. Right. And I don't expect you to have the answer to this because nobody does. Right, right. Um, well, the first thing I would want to say is, of course, the national popular vote interstate compact is not a perfect solution because it's addressing a very messy, complicated problem, as you point out in your book. I mean, the Electoral College is an absolute mess and it's a, you know, it's- It's a multi-dimensional mess. Yeah, and it's an accident waiting to happen every four years. Uh, I mean, Jefferson himself called it an ink blot on the constitution. Um, and so it's always been recognized that it's the dangerous and dangerously unstable. The instability, 
comes from the Electoral College. And, um, you know, I guess I'd make two points. One is that in the improvisational statutory or state constitutional mechanisms that were adopted by states to deal with things like um, legis state legislative selection of senators or women's disenfranchisement or racial disenfranchisement and lots of states would do their own thing. They were also subject to the same kinds of instability and political reversals and so on. So I don't know that that's some kind of decisive takedown of the national popular vote. But the other thing I would say is that my support for it from the very beginning, I think I was clear about it to my colleagues in the Maryland State Senate, you know, when I got up and introduced it as my very first bill in public mm -hmm. office, um, my, my vision was that it would work for maybe one or two cycles. And then every Congress would say the way it did with women's suffrage and direct election of senators, it's obvious. This is what people want. This is where the country is. Let's move there. So I don't, I guess, I suppose I don't disagree with what you're saying about, you know, the possibility of technical instability. Um, you know, having said that, I think it was, you know, it was a great breakthrough to see that the states could do something and we're, each one was not locked in its own solitude in dealing with this particular problem. And, I, and, and that was when I met John Coza, you know, who was the, the guy who sort of articulated this. I mean, he, he is a, um, he's a computer genius and political computer I guess he's a computer scientist who got interested in the problem. He also invented the scratch-off lottery ticket. So I thought, you know, this guy knows what he's doing, you know. So um, anyway, but and we made some changes and we worked with it. And um, and I, I suppose, you know, I don't know fully your thinking, and that was one of the reasons why I wanted to come to the conference to hear where you are on it now, Alex. But it seems to me that there can be, you know, many rooms in the mansion of people saying, let's move to a popular vote, a popular system for electing the president. And your reservations seem to be more of a, of a technical or procedural nature. Well, I th and people really came here, I think, to hear you and not me. So I don't want to go, I don't want, I would just say a couple of things. I'm not sure that they're purely technical. They're, my objections have to do with looking at this over a longer flow of time and not wanting to, I don't think we want to have four to eight years of instability where, for example, um, different states are deciding whether to leave the compact or join up the compact. And there's kind of gamesmanship going on about whether a particular party would rather have an election by compact rules or old electoral college rules mm -hmm. um, in the next election. And then the other concern that I have with the compact, and again, this is something which I would hope would fade away, but I don't quite see how to do it, is that the compact actually keeps the other features of the electoral college in place. Uh, the apparatus of the electoral college re remains the same, and that worries me. And I, you know, and I look, look you know, people, people, people have good. I, I, I guess I, I'm approaching this in the spirit of not, you know, they're wrong, I'm right, et cetera. But can we, can we reason together to actually figure out the best, the best strategies forward? That's well, um, and I'll think some more about it. But I, I guess my first instinct is just to say, imagine. The, it's actually very far along. I think um, with Maine, it's beyond two thirds of the electoral college votes that are needed. So there's a lot of progress that's taking place. Um, but imagine that it were in place before the 2024 election. I think that, that that's the, probably impossible now. But um, but if it were, and say we get what I think we're going to get, which is a landslide election for democracy. Um, and uh, you know, re-election of President Biden, and so then the popular vote and electoral college vote would be lined up anyway, as uh, they they were a bit unevenly, but they were in uh, 2020. Um, then that might be the spur that people need. Now there might need to be some kind of party realignment going on at the same time, so that we don't get the same kind of ferocious party opposition to it. But I do know, you know, when I first started out in Maryland, uh, you know, we had a lot of Republicans who wanted to support it. There are a bunch of Republican controlled chambers in different parts of the country that have voted for it. I think in Michigan uh, or I think in Ohio, I mean, a number of states where 
I mean, most Americans, when you poll people, they either say, I support the national popular vote plan, or they already think it's the law. They, you know, they don't understand the electoral college system, uh, the way it works. So a combination of those people who think we've already got it and those people who want it gives you an overwhelming majority um, in the country. And so, uh, but we are in this period of bitter partisan division, which I think is blockading us a bit. And certainly the poll, the polling also makes clear that there's a, there's a, there can be a kind of partisan opportunism until 2016, if you look at the polling, significant majorities of both Democrats and Republicans were in favor of abolishing the Electoral College. And as soon as the 2016 election happened, Republican support plummeted by about 25 percent. So suddenly the Electoral College was, good, was a good thing. It has since crept, crept back up. But let, I'm not even sure, though, that that's because they lost the popular vote and won the Electoral College vote. I think it's because Trump said maybe. We're, we're opposed to doing this. Right. right. Well, he, I mean, right. And I mean, he did go from having opposed it to saying it was it was an, it was a it was a work of genius, yes. which which if he if he actually read if he read the, if he read the debates in the Constitutional Convention, which read much more like people scratching their heads and saying, how the hell do we like the president? What what's going on here? Let's appoint the committee and have somebody else decide. That is the way it happened. Um, OK, before opening this up to. Uh, questions from our very patient audience. Um, let me let me pose uh, a question uh, or a combined set of questions. Um, you know, in in the research that I've done about uh, about the history of the electoral college and the, and the history of efforts to reform it, um, and you know, as like there have been many many such efforts, some of which have come very close. Uh, I'll be talking about that in the next session of this conference, uh, where I will be doing a 15-minute rendition of my 400-page book. Um, but um, we have come we, we've come very close on on a, on, a, on a couple of different occasions. And and actually, let me make the point here, um, which I will make in the next session. But you, you will have to leave. The fact is, the times we have come closest to getting rid of, which is in the eight, around 1820 and in 1969-70. Um, were times when the party systems were in flux and were instable and unstable, right? Because if you look at what the party system was like, I mean, the Democratic Party by 1969 was not really a party. It had split into northern and southern wings, mm -hmm. and the Republican Party was also kind of split. And in, in the 1820s, there was really only one party because the Federalists had collapsed and the, the Whigs had not uh, had not reappeared or had not, had not, had not appeared. So mm -hmm. this notion that potential party instability in the near future might create an opening is something that I think is very, very true. Yeah, I mean, uh, you need the ability to have a reform impulse in both parties. Right, and you, parties. and you also need to have the ability, you, you, you need to deprive parties of the ability to think that they can make a clear calculus that the Electoral College benefits or doesn't benefit them. You know, it, so it's, if, it's, if it's murkier, um, then, then people might actually return yeah. to voting on principle. Well, I remember when when I had my first vote on it, and a couple of senators cornered me in our Democratic cloakroom. They said, "Look, I know you're saying it doesn't really benefit one part or the other, but just between us, we won't <laughs> tell anybody. Like, who is it really going to help us, or is it going to help them?" And I'm like, "I'll tell you. I'll tell you a secret. I'll tell you a secret. It's going to help." whoever gets the most votes. <laughs> so, <laughs> All right, well, let me wind, let me, let me wind that into my, uh, the last question that I want to pose to you um, and, and start with an observation, which is that in, um, in reading about the, the history of these reform efforts, to my, uh, or, and I, I had this, ins this insight, if it is an insight, like two weeks ago, and I finished the book three years ago. Um, but... Um, one thing that I never that that was absent from the reform uh, sort of past and from the from, from the landscape was protests about public protests about the electoral college, right? Uh, I haven't seen much in almost no you know like public marches. It's it's been people feel strongly about it. We know that from the from from the polling, and we know that political professionals get involved. So one one question lurking in my mind. And it's related to a broader question, since there are a lot of reformers and students and students who are reformers in this audience is, um, what can we do 
to advance the cause. I mean, one of my concerns, and I'll state this too, about the compact is that it's been focused on state legislators rather than on voters. So that it, it's, it hasn't been a popular movement. It's been very much within state legislature. So what, you know, what, what in, you, in your mind, and you're gonna, and Jamie's gonna be back with us tomorrow, but when he can during the day for, uh, during the conference, but you know, what can we do to push this forward? And, you know, and would you like to lead a march in Washington uh, um, on this subject? Well, first of all, the party of democracy broadly defined in America has got to play defense for the electoral college and offense against it. And we were playing defense for the electoral college on January 6, 2021. I mean, they were trying to overrun the workings of the electoral college, which was the real system that was in place. So suddenly, you know, I had been this sworn opponent of the electoral college and I had to defend every little <laughs> rule and every little maneuver in detail of the system, which I would because the alternative was fascist chaos, right? And um, But at the same time, we've got to be doing the educational thing about let us lawfully disengage and disenthrall ourselves from the system. Um, and, um, you know, I, I will say on behalf of the National Popular Vote, interstate compact campaign, they've taken it to like every state. They've gone to every state. And it's true, it's been focused on the state capitals. And it's been kind of an insider's game in terms of the legislators and so on. But then you've got to lobby the legislators and go to their districts. And so um, it's not been the kind of mass movement you're talking about, like the women's movement or the civil rights movement or the LGBTQ movement. Um, and, you know, they're just, I don't know, there are enough people who take the electoral college personally, like in that way at this point. Um, but the, I think it's a great question for this conference, how you transform it. And I would say, um, it's connected to a whole coalition of like related democracy issues. I mean, we have uh, we've added 37 states since the union started. The Article Four admission of new states is a really critical mechanism for lifting people up to a plane of political equality. And it's the 21st century, and America remains the only democratic nation on earth that disenfranchises the people of its capital city. I mean, can you imagine if the people in Paris were not represented in <laughs> L'Assemblée Nationale because they breathed the same air as the people who came to vote there, right? You'd have another French Revolution on your hands. And so, you know, I think you put together DC statehood and Puerto Rican statehood, three and a half million US citizens who are locked out of not just Congress, but also the way that people in DC have no voting representation in Congress, but also presidential elections. And that's a point I think of great offense there. Um, and so I've always thought that there could be the grounds of a partisan deal on this, the way so many states have come into the union, you know, like uh, Kansas, uh, uh, Nebraska, and uh, I think Maine, Kentucky. I mean, it was always a North and the South, there was always a deal to get them through. And Puerto Rican statehood has been part of the Republican platform for decades. And DC statehood is now uh, a real object of support within the Democratic Party. So, you know, maybe something could happen there. But I think if you put together a series of democracy reforms, that's the way to go. And uh, Tocqueville said in Democracy in America that voting rights and democracy are either shrinking and shriveling away in our country, or they're expanding and they're growing. And so we got to get back on the growth track. And uh, I always like John Dewey saying that only solution to the ills of democracy is more democracy. And what we're suffering from today is not democracy, but the obstacles and impediments to it, like the voter suppression and the gerrymandering and the filibuster and the electoral college. And on that note, let's open this up. We have about 20, 25 minutes for questions. And I see Larry Lessig has his hand up. Hello, Professor Lessig. I saw you there. Um, so I, I'm really fascinated with the idea whether the Electoral Count Reform Act, like the Electoral Count Act before that, actually has any binding authority inside of Congress. And the reason that strikes me is that if you look at the objections on January 6th that Josh Hawley was pushing, you know, the state that they were talking about was Pennsylvania. Under the Electoral Count Act, 
Pennsylvania was the easiest case. It was a state where they had a procedure for resolving contests. The procedure was resolved more than six days before the electoral uh, the electors were to vote. The electors voted. There was no ambiguity about who they voted for. And under the Electoral Count Act, the only question Congress was allowed to consider was whether the votes were regularly given. And by that, it meant the votes of the electors, not the votes of the people in Pennsylvania. So you would think that there was just no debate in Pennsylvania to be had on the floor of Congress, yet Josh Hawley and 146 of your colleagues stood there and objected to that vote. And one way to uh, interpret that is that the law didn't matter because the law plainly said there was no basis for your objection. So I wonder when you think about the Electoral Count Reform Act, whether you think that people in Congress think of this actually as something that's binding them or whether this is just you know some structure which you can take advantage of if you'd like to. Well, the, 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 their interpretation of regularly given was given consistent with law, and then they threw a million eggs at what took okay, place. But, but wait, no, no. The question is whose vote is regularly given? There was no ambiguity that the Biden electors voted for Biden. That was completely unambiguous. Right? Yeah. So their vote was regularly given. The statute does not talk about the voters, right? So that's my point. Right. It's clearly not applicable to the argument about whether you should have had absentee ballots or any of that stuff. Yeah. It's irrelevant. And yet, you know, that was the whole fight. And yet nobody seemed to stand up and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Right. Read the words. Well, vote regularly given of the electors. And I think if you look at some of those, like John Eastman memos and uh, my law school classmate, um, Chesbro, I mean, a number of them were, were casting doubt on the constitutionality of the Electoral Count Act and any statute because uh, under the 12th Amendment, it's up to Congress to count the votes or it's up to the vice president to, you know, take the money and run and just do his own thing, right? And um, so there is, a, I think there is a lot of political habit and values that have accumulated in our respect for what happens in the states and the casting of the ballots. But and that, that goes to kind of that last point I was making. It's dangerous, it's hazardous, because there's so many little nooks and crannies in the haunted house of the Electoral College that if somebody decides they really want to mess with you, they're going to go to the state legislatures and say, you've got plenary power over the electors, disregard the vote because they kept polls open an extra hour because of the hurricane or because whatever. And you can always gin up some justification for a departure if there are all these other nodes of power along the way. And what I'm afraid of is in the same way that my colleagues continue to adhere to the big lie. And, you know, uh, Trump just sacked everybody at the Republican National Committee. And then they were asked to reapply for their jobs with one question, which is, uh, was the 2020 election stolen or not? I mean, you really have got to follow the leader on that point. And so they were willing to say and do anything. I mean, Mike Johnson, who's now Speaker of the House, he was the one who put together the amicus brief, um, basically giving le a legal veneer to the coup and the insurrection that took place on January 6th. So I don't know if you're making... Um, a point about just the ultimate indeterminacy and inscrutability of law, um, or you know, if you're saying we need a better statute in place. I mean, I just think we understand in our political culture what an election is, and people have a general sense. It doesn't mean people don't fight over it, but we had 60 federal and state court cases decisively repudiating everything they were saying about electoral fraud and corruption, and they didn't care about that. They were still willing to try to drive it to that final moment on January the 6th. And that's what makes me afraid of, you know, each of the steps in the process. And we haven't even begun to, you know, game out all the different nightmare scenarios for January 6th, 2025, but there's a lot of them. You know. Let me uh, back, the, back the, the back row. Hello, uh, hello. Uh, and my name is Alexander. I'm here, an MPP two student. So you mentioned at the very beginning, saying that with the current setup of the electoral college, we're essentially focusing on seven, eight to ten states. 
if moving to the popular vote, do you think that we will, or at least the United States, because I'm not a citizen, will replace one unfairness with the other with focusing solely on the states or the areas with large populations? So will we essentially be disregarding or forgetting about large areas, if not the populations of the so country? So let me ask you a question, if you don't mind. Where do you, what state do you live in? And, uh, I mean, I live here. I'm from Serbia, but uh, I live here now. Okay, so say, take Massachusetts, because I don't know Serbian elections that well. But, okay. <laughs> uh, but in Massachusetts... Someone might say, imagine that they had some primitive electoral college kind of system based on the towns and the cities and they're all voting and so on that could sometimes upset the popular vote or what have you. And then someone said, no, why don't we just have one person, one vote? Every vote in Massachusetts counts equally regardless of where you live. And then someone raises the objection you just articulated so well, which is, well, that just means all the campaigning will be in Boston or Worcester. But if you talk to anybody who's ever run statewide for anything in Massachusetts, they will tell you that's crazy, that you can't just win by going to the largest population center. For one thing, the vote could be split in those places, right, especially in primaries or what have you. Um, But beyond that, most of the people don't live in Boston or Worcester. They live in the other places. So theoretically, if you're the perfect campaign manager, you would have some kind of rough proportional allocation of your budget um, following the population in the entire state. So you would see, you know, as opposed to what we have now, where like the TV ads don't run in most of America. I'm not saying that that's like a great loss, but you also don't have, you know, you don't have the campaigns setting up offices. You don't have people knocking on doors. You have dramatically different voter turnout in the swing states from everywhere else. So it's just like an illogical way of doing it so uh, given the size my question was essentially is there any mid midway where both the needs of the people representation of the people but also needs of the broader country well are yeah taken into account i mean and just to toot the horn of our founders a little bit i mean that's kind of what the u.s senate is the u.s senate makes certain that the big states and the small states uh all have equal representation i mean i was out in california campaigning the other day And I I woke up in a state where there's 42 million people and they have two senators. And one of them was Dianne Feinstein for a long time. And she was, you know, not in great shape for a long time. Um, But they have two senators. Then if you take 42 million people waking up um, in the 20 smallest states, it's actually a number smaller than the number in California. Those people have 40 senators. So California's got two and those people 40. So there's a hugely disproportionate inflation of the power of the smaller states. Um, And so I think that takes care of the problem you're talking about to make sure that nobody gets overlooked. Some people would say there's an overcompensation in the way that the Senate is organized. But in any event, we only have one president. So you're, you're not gonna be able to elect a president who's from everywhere, right? We happen to have a president who's from one of our smallest states. I mean, Delaware is an extremely small state, you know, um, and they certainly get their fear of the attention, you know, so. I see a hand there, here. Thank you so much for joining us. I am um, uh, MCMPA mid-career uh, studying here. And I had a question about um, six, almost 60 years since the uh, Baldwin and Buckley debate where someone said, just let, Black people vote in Mississippi, and Buckley responded, the problem isn't that Black people need to vote, the problem is that too many white people vote. And I feel like the sentiment is still the same for a lot of people in power, where they want to keep that small, regardless of race, and um, even though, of course, it's disproportionately Black and Brown, uh, but also disproportionately Democratic. So how do we have any kind of uh, hope (laughs) or any kind of um, capacity to Well, you know, this th- that's, that's a great question. That's why I'm interested in the conclusions of the, I guess you had a session about election administration, right? Yeah. And I mean, so much of elections is based on the administrative technology and apparatus that's put into place. You know, we're very rare in the Western world, certainly, in having, in not having the government register people to vote. Like, you know, we have a thing where we're, the parties are scrambling, the candidates are scrambling, let's go 
you know, register people to vote, but then you can get in trouble if you register too many. In some states, I think in Florida now, you can only register up to 10 if you go over that. You know, you're, it's a misdemeanor if you go for 20, it's a felony. And um, so that's very strange. Like in France, uh, when you're born, you are assigned a number that is both your, your immediate health insurance number, um, and then also it will be your voting number when you, you know, achieve majority. Um, and then you're just registered. Uh, and I think you're supposed to tell them when you move or what have you. But we've got a very ramshackle system that's rooted in the idea that the vast majority of people could not vote when it all started. And it's been a struggle to get people the right to vote. But, uh, you know, I, if you check, check out what's going on in the states now with the Supreme Court dismantling the Voting Rights Act in Shelby County versus Holder in 2013, a lot of states are purging people if they didn't vote in the last election, or you have to constantly re-register if you're disabled or if you have to vote from home and you, you got a ballot sent to you, it won't just be sent to you in the next election. You got to re-register again to have it. I mean, it's just, it's chaos. It's a mess. Um, and so we don't have a national voter registration system. We haven't worked any of those problems out nationally. Every state does their own thing based on their own, you know, political criteria, their own pressures and so on. And you can imagine uh, that there are states that don't that want to make it very difficult for people to vote. Like you can come and register in person between four and four forty-five on Wednesdays. You know that kind of thing. Um, and that's that's been the history of it: literacy tests, poll taxes, grandfather clauses. Um, you know all of it, and it has been a struggle against that. So this is another reason, I don't know if you're ready to have a conference on this one, Alex, but um, we, we don't have a constitutional amendment just establishing a right to vote. Oh, uh, no, we know we don't, but yeah. you you and I worked together for years uh, yeah. trying trying to trying to do that, and now Rick Hassan, uh, a very notable election law expert, has come out with a book. Um, just on right. that, Rick Hassan, yeah. So the, we just have these anti-discrimination amendments. You can't discriminate based on race, you can't discriminate based on sex and so on. But we don't have, if you look, look at the new South Africa constitution, just says everybody has a right to vote at every level of government uh, over them. But we can't do that because it's so patchwork and we do have millions of disenfranchised people in the territories, in DC, uh, former prisoners in some states. Like Florida, I thought they took care of that by a <laughs> referendum and the legislature says, yeah, you can have your right to vote back as soon as you pay us for the costs of your incarceration. So now they're in court on whether that's a poll tax or not. It certainly sounds like a poll tax. You know. In the early 2000s, uh, Jamie and I were both working very hard on a, on a, on a constant to, to promote a constitutional amendment uh, for the right, the right to vote. And I remember getting into it. It was after, it was after Bush v. Gore and after what had happened in Florida. And I began and I was thinking, wow, you know, just, just guaranteeing the right to vote. The right to vote is as American as motherhood and apple pie. Who's, who could possibly be against putting a right to vote in the Constitution? I was very young and naive then. <laughs> um, and, and I learned a lot over the next few years. Put your hands. Ned Foley. Um, my question. Hi, Ned. Hi. Great to see you. Um, my question concerns the... Oh, sorry. My question concerns the relationship of the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact and the so-called spoiler problem. There's all this media attention right now about whether or not Robert Kennedy Jr. is going to be a spoiler for Biden or a spoiler for Trump. But the premise of all that discussion seems to be that we shouldn't have spoilers. That that's a problem in, in, in an electoral system. <laughs> um, and... You know, that debate now is happening, obviously, given the Electoral College system on a state by state basis. Is, is it going to be a spoiler in Wisconsin or Pennsylvania? Yeah. But if we move to a national popular vote with a plurality winner, we replicate the spoiler problem on the national level. So how do we handle that? OK, cool. Well, we, the first thing I want to say about that is, is uh, that that spoiler to me is a political epithet. It's not a juridical category. Right. I mean, it, 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 party candidate that could affect which of the two major party candidates win. They've got every right to do it, stated in that way. That you know, we, we don't. The, the Constitution doesn't establish um, 
a two-party system, much less two specific parties. People forget the Republican Party was a third party that ousted and overthrew the Whigs, right? Because they would not deal with the slavery issue. Um, so, I mean, even if you're somebody who believes in a two-party system, certainly you, you want to believe in a fluid two-party system where, you, you know, the people who are the ins can't just anoint themselves permanently the party actors. I, this does make me persona non grata in my party because I'm always standing up for the rights of the independents and the third parties to do their thing. But um, you've got to believe that that is an essential component of the First Amendment and of equal protection. You know, I, it doesn't make sense to me like in my state, like for me to get on the ballot as a Democrat, I just need one signature, my own signature, and then I sign it. And if you want to get on the ballot as a Green Party libertarian, you just need like 87,000 signatures <laughs> when everybody's ward and precinct and congressional district and don't forget their middle initial. And if it's not there, we're going to throw you up. But I mean, I'm opposed to all that stuff. I think that that's wrong. But um, so, you know, I do strongly favor and I am the author in Congress of the ranked choice voting mechanism, which says I've got no problem if people want to register their initial vote for the Reform Party or Libertarian or whatever. But if you use ranked choice voting, somebody needs a majority to win. And so that creates a majority winner because we want a majority winner. It also has the added and I think um, the underrated virtue of dramatically reducing negative politics because now if we're running against each other, I can say, oh, you're for Ned. Well, he's great. I love him. Would you make me your second choice or your third choice instead of your eighth or ninth choice or whatever it is, as opposed to, oh, no, Ned sucks. Let me try to bring bring your vote down. Right. And so I think in the places where ranked choice voting has been adopted, it has been a great enhancement to positive coalition forming politics. You know, and I think that's the way of dealing with, you know, the so-called spoiler problem or really the problem that I think is being properly identified is not having a majority winner. And there's something, at least in our political culture, to saying, yes, somebody should have a majority so they've got the opportunity to govern effectively as long as they're in. How do you marry that with the So, um, let's see, the, well, the, uh, well, yeah, we haven't, we haven't dealt with that problem, I suppose. Um, but I would, I would put it this way. It's a much worse problem today under the Electoral College, because if you go back to Florida, like Nader, in Florida, right? You, if you, so Nader ended up with, I can't remember, was it like 50,000 votes or so, how many? 90,000 votes. And the difference was 500 votes between Gore and Bush, right? Now, if you'd had ranked choice voting there, then you could have made it work, but we didn't have ranked choice voting. So I think that, say there's a spoiler party. The spoiler party would love the current system a lot more than a nationwide system because the nationwide system um, there's a lot more votes that you've got to try to influence, right? So uh, Biden beat Trump by three and a half million. I think with all the new people, maybe he beats him by five or six or seven million um, in this election. So your best bet would be a system like this where you could say, well, let's see if we can affect enough votes in Pennsylvania or Wisconsin as a third party run a Nader type candidate to depress somebody's majority and then flip over all those electors as opposed to a popular vote where they're not going to be able to move millions of votes like that. Let's try to squeeze in one or two uh, more questions. I was, I, was, I was going to say from people I don't know, but then two people I know, who are, uh, Jenny Mansbridge and then Jesse. Thanks. Uh, if the compact is to serve as a first step to the abolition of the Electoral College, then the arguments for that compact ought to really resonate with the people. That's the whole point in a way, is to move it along. But I haven't heard um, from you, and I haven't heard in general, an argument that the Electoral College was instituted by elites who didn't trust the people, who disdained the people, who wanted to take power from the people. That, seems, that argument seems to me to resonate today with people who feel disdained and that people are taking power from them. Yeah, it's, but it's why, a, it's but a I don't great hear point. That. I, don't, it didn't, I didn't hear that from you. Well, he's the historian. You got to hear it from him. I, mean, I know, I, I, know I, Alex, I thought Alex was but even lay Alex, it out. But even Alex didn't repeat that argument yeah. today in the form that I'm repeating it now, in the sort of populist yes. form. 
of this is an anti-populist, anti-people. You know that I know that's argument. Alex has said this over and over, but he didn't say it this evening, or this afternoon, and you didn't say it either. Really. Well, I, maybe we fear we're speaking to elites, and we don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> but, uh, uh, no, but no, but but uh, I, I will tell you, Jenny. It, I would go even further than that because I think it, that the abolition of electoral college is a small D democratic imperative, for precisely the reason you're saying. It was all about controlling who was going to get into office. And remember, it was going to be the wise men who were going to be appointed electors, which they were in many states in statute appointed electors, and they would go and deliberate. But it was also profoundly racist and intertwined with the politics of slavery because of the three-fifths compromise. But don't get into racism. Well, the yeah, well, I mean, the, the, all of the black people who were treated the, the three-fifths compromise plays a really fascinating role here. I'm sure you've read Gary Wills's book on this, The Negro President, about Jefferson. But the, the three-fifths compromise inflated by a dozen the slave master's delegations coming from the South because it said we're going to take 60% of the enslaved people population in the South. We're going to count them for these purposes and these purposes only. The Northerners were saying, hey, they shouldn't count it off. You're not going to allow them to vote. You're not going to allow them to run for office. And South saying, oh, no, no, we think they should count completely. And then they arrived at the three-fifths compromise, which was a fraction borrowed from the Articles of Confederation. So they went, they went to three-fifths compromise. And then suddenly, the South had all this power in the House, but also because the Electoral College is the number of representatives you have, plus the two bonus electors for the senators, it gave a distinct... Dixie accent to the presidency. Four out of our five first presidents were slave masters who brought their enslaved human beings with them in the presidency. Seven out of the first 10, an overwhelming number of them from Virginia. That was the reality of it, just like it was the reality that they didn't want, you know, uh, common white folk voting either. They wanted, you know, the right kind of people deciding in the legislatures. And I think that is an important part of the story to be told. It lasted all the way through the 20th century, too, where you had people like Strom Thurmond, people like Harry Byrd from Virginia, George Wallace, who left the Democratic Party when it took a civil rights position and said, we're going to run as independents. And they picked up 30, 40, 50 electoral college votes to send a sharp message to the Democratic Party about the price of standing for, for civil rights. So that is the real history of the Electoral College. And I don't know politically what, you know, what the people in this room think or what you think, Alex, about how much to emphasize the anti-democratic, anti-populist, and anti-Black roots of the Electoral College system. I don't know, I don't know either. I mean, I think that you can make those cases, but I think that I think the case can also be made on purely contemporary grounds, you know, with the questions of the inequality. But I think that, but, you know, as with all things, I think informing people about the history does make sense. Well, you tell the story of how there was a civil rights argument made for the Electoral College in the 1960s. Tell them that story. But yeah. yeah, I mean, or actually, yeah, in the late, late 1960s and the early 1970s, um, there were the, the African-American political leaders were divided and many of them thought that the Electoral College served the interest of the African-American community um, because they, uh, they were sort of key blocks of voters in key, in key swing states. Um, and thus they thought that moving, switching to a national popular vote would undermine their political power. And that, and that, I mean, that was Vernon Jordan. That was the head of most of the African American organizations. And there were civil rights supporters in both parties at that point. Right. Today, a right. majority of the African American population still lives in southern states, where basically, you know, Donald Trump got all of the electoral college votes except for Virginia and North Carolina. Right. 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 I mean, no, no exactly. And, and part of the reality today is that most African Americans in the South, you know, who are sixty years old have never had a, an electoral vote cast for the candidate that they supported, um, which is a remarkable fact. Um, we, we're running out of time. Jesse Wegman had his hand up, a woman here, and then there's a young man deep in the back corner who has also had his hand up. But let's round it up with that. Unfortunately, I, we don't, I don't think, oh, we could stay here for a couple of hours. But uh, I, just, I just want to make two quick observations. One sort of pivoting off of this last really good comment, I thought that reflected your concern, which I thought was reasonable about the compacts 
uh, focus on state legislatures at the expense of voters. I just want to point out there, you know, we don't have a national referendum yet, so we can't do it that way. But there are states that there, there are state referendums, uh, such as in Michigan, that could uh, adopt the compact in those states, which would be voter driven. And we did see something like that in Colorado in the last election where they're the opponents of the compact, which had been passed in Colorado, got on the ballot uh, an effort to overturn uh, that adoption, and they lost, right? So that was, in effect, a referendum in the state of Colorado. So in those ways, uh, there have been more direct, uh, there has been more direct public engagement with the idea of the compact, and I think that's a good, I agree with you, I think that's an important thing. And then the other just quick point I want to make is you both pointed out um, Donald Trump's conversion on the value of the Electoral College after 2016. And yes, he did. He, you know, he had originally said it's a disaster for democracy, and then he came around. Um, and uh, But I just want just to give him his due, uh, because I will never do that <laughs> in any other uh, setting, I would like to point out that he also, in the days after the 2016 election, continued to say it would be better if I had won with a majority of the popular vote. He said this on 60 Minutes on national TV a week after he had won the election while losing by 3 million votes. Yeah. He said it would be better if you did it this way, where you got 100 million votes and the person who got 90 million. It would million. be so much better he decided he had won by a <laughs> yeah, well, majority of the votes. And that's so, yeah. a great point, right? <laughs> yeah. that why did he care so much about all those illegals voting in California, right? It's because he knew the legitimacy comes with majority rule. So I think yeah. it's important to when we talk about reform and when we talk about strategies for reform to hold on to that realization that everybody in their gut knows that majority rule is the right way to do it. <laughs> yes. And even Donald Trump and even his supporters know it. You know, this is, this is, there's this big kind of charade going on right now and everybody's got like, they're, they're this weird mind meld. But like, but everybody, if you ask them, understands that majority rule is the way to do it. And I think capturing that feeling, that kind of almost from childhood, that gut feeling is going to be a really important part of any movement going forward. Good. And um, we, I, I don't know your name. Since... Thank you, Catherine Pichardo. Um, and thank you very much uh, to both of you for the great conversation. Um, I did want to piggyback on the comment earlier, um, actually the last two comments, uh, and something you said earlier, Congressman, about intersectionality and how we move to the next level in terms of reform. Um, I think uh, intersectionality always wins as someone who works on campaigns for a living. Uh, and you talked about getting other folks within the democracy space. I think ultimately what people want to hear uh, about democracy is how it impacts their everyday lives, right? Uh, so moving outside Side of the academic conversation into why democracy matters, right? In terms of opportunity, um, the economy, uh, reproductive rights, uh, healthcare, um, and and everything that we hold dear. So um, certainly, I'm very excited about the next day and a half, and I appreciate your comments. Looking forward to working with everyone here on how we move the conversation forward. That's awesome. Well, and uh, thank you for. Um, you know, elucidating that pragmatic sense of democracy that people have. Um, and that's a large part of the, the burden on President Biden to show both he's defending democracy in the terms he talked about it in Valley Forge and at the State of the Union Address as a system of government, but also because he's been able to deliver under the system of democracy, whether we're talking about infrastructure or prescription drug reform and so on. But the other thing that I think uh, we need to link it to, either in a partisan or in a nonpartisan context, is the relationship between democracy and freedom. Um, because freedom is under attack all over the world, just like it's under attack in America. There's a beautiful passage from Lincoln where he was asked, well, you know, he always talked about the Declaration, you know, and up to him, up until he became president, the Constitution was always the frame of reference for the presidents, but he did four score and seven years ago, going back to 1776. And somebody said to him, well, you know, why, why are you talking about that? What's the relationship between the values of the Declaration and the constitutional framework? Because, well, the Constitution is like the beautiful silver platter upon which rests the golden apple of freedom. And that's what the Declaration is about, he said. 
it's life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness and all men being created equal and so on. So in other words, you could translate that to our situation today with democracy under attack all over the world. Like somebody like Putin or Orban or Trump um, or Marcos or Xi or Kim Jong-un is never going to protect your freedoms, right? It's only in a democracy where we've got the chance of electing people who will defend your freedom. But even then, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. It's a struggle. I mean, look at, you know, we, even after the Civil War and the Reconstruction Amendments and the 14th Amendment and the 15th Amendment, um, you know, African-American people in our country were disenfranchised for another century until the civil rights movement. So, like, you can even have it in the law, and it doesn't mean anything without the struggle to make it real. The last question goes to, Nick is giving me a cut sign, but there's this is this young man in the bleachers there who has had his hand up for a long time. Uh, thanks so much for your time. I, I, I'm going to try not to open a can of worms because we're closing things off here. But um, I was, you know, I found it interesting that populism was referenced as a reason to do the general election, right? And I think the founders, for all the flaws in our founding documents, were really thoughtful about how do we try to maximize you know, a just and free society. And intermediate institutions was part of that. And so I feel a little bit of tension there. And I wonder if there's any role for that in, in how we think about this answer. Oh, man. Well, um, yeah, I, I, think, I think I disagree with that. I mean, I mean, I, or put it this way, I agree with your characterization of how it started, but I think that our whole history has been a rebellion against what Professor Mansbridge calls the elitist, dem, you know, anti-democratic filters of the original government. In other words, we have faith in democratic populism. And there I'm talking about Lawrence Goodwin populism, you know, of the 19th century. I'm not talking about fraudulent Trump style populism, which the founders did understand. Um, and you read the very first Federalist paper by Hamilton, he warned against uh, people who would start by whipping up the negative emotions of people against our own institutions. Um, begin as demagogues, he said, and end as tyrants, right? I mean, Donald Trump doesn't know anything about the founders, but they knew a lot about him, right? right. But, but I'll tell you this about January 6th, because believe me, I was thinking a lot about this on January 6th as it was happening. Um, even if you believed Donald Trump's, you know, most promiscuous inflation of the numbers of people he had in his mob that day, Call it 100,000, okay? That was one-eighth the size of my congressional district, one out of 435. And Lincoln said at the first inaugural address, he said, insurrection is an attack on the first principle of representative government, which is people get to choose their own officials. So they were in there chanting, our house, this is our house and all that. I'm sorry, it's your house only through the constitutional system that we've derived and they were not there lawfully under that system and they couldn't take it down. So I wanna make our actual constitutional process as democratic, as populist as possible. That's why we wanna get rid of the electoral college. At the same time, we gotta keep Hamilton's point in mind from article from the first Federalist paper, which is that doesn't mean that people can just show up, shout everybody down and violently overthrow the system that we've got. And on that, and on that note, um, I think we, we do have to bring things to an end. We're over time. The next session begins five minutes ago. Um, <laughs> and and we'll, we'll take a brief pause and, 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 and what, five minutes? Come back, come back in five minutes. But what I, what I want to do now